Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel and today something quite not so retro. We're going to be reset glitch hacking this Xbox 360. Now before we even get started I'm going to be doing the RGH3 hack which isn't necessarily recommended for the fat versions of the 360. It can be hit and miss, sometimes it won't work at all, sometimes it'll work perfectly, sometimes it'll work for a little while and then stop glitching. So Keep that in mind, it's not fully recommended to do the RGH3 on a FAT360, but we're going to give it a shot anyway. This particular one is a Falcon, which you can tell from just looking at the power plug, and also it has HDMI out. So this may work, it may not. Uh, for this, I'm just going to be using the Raspberry Pi Pico, which you can use to flash and read back the NAND chip in the 360. But without an actual glitch chip or something to write to the glitch chip, like an X-Flash at 360, which is what's usually recommended, we're not going to be able to do any of the RGH 1.2 hacks, which is what's actually recommended still for the fat versions. So we'll try the RGH 3. If it doesn't work, then, well, I guess I'll invest in a X-Flash at 360. So let's just quickly go over what we're going to need. Obviously, the Raspberry Pi Pico. We're going to need seven wires to connect from the Pico to the main board. I'm also going to use some pin headers on the actual Pico, so I can just plug these straight in. We need a 22K resistor and a simple diode like a 1N4148. We'll also need a T8 and a T10 Torx bit, and highly recommended is one of these tools. This will actually help us pop open the case. I'll put a link down in the description to where you can find this thing, and also highly recommended is the X-Clamp removal tool, so I'll put a link in the description for both of these. And it is highly recommended to replace the thermal paste in here. I'm not going to do that in this video because I literally just did that last week for this console, but something like the Arctic MX-4 is a good choice for thermal paste. Oh, and one final thing that I did was update the dashboard to the latest version, which is 17559. It was running 17.489, uh, but I'd recommend updating the dashboard before you do the hack. So get the latest dashboard on there and then reset glitch hack it. The only exception to that would be if you're on a really early dashboard that's still JTAGable. So any of the Blades dashboards or just after they went to the NXE dashboards, I think a couple of them are still JTAGable, but anything after that, you've got no chance. So you may as well just update it to the latest version, save any headaches later. So let's get this thing cracked open and we'll start on the hacking. So of course, first things first, just remove the hard drive if there's one attached and the front face plate, it's usually just easier to put things in there and pull it off. This one is missing the little spring for that, which is a bit of a shame, but what can you do? Now we need to get these side pieces off and this is where this tool can definitely come in handy. Otherwise a small flat blade screwdriver will also do the job. So. If you look through the case, you may be able to see there's bits of plastic behind some of these holes. So that's where our little clips are. So you just want to push this in and lift up on the side panel as you go. So there's another one here. We'll just push that in and that should pop out. Sometimes it'll get caught on the clip on the opposite side of the case. So again, you just push in there and just keep lifting out as you go. The final clips are right at the back here. So we should be able to just push in on that. This console's obviously been opened before, so it's a little bit easier to get into, but uh, if you've got a console that's never been opened before, the clips might be a little bit tighter. Now for this side where the hard drive is, there are two clips up the front here, and you'll notice there's also two holes down here. So what we need to do is simply slide our tool towards the top of the case or the bottom of the case, and you should be able to fill one of those clips and you just lift up like that once you've popped the clip open. And then same deal, there's another clip in the middle. And likewise, a clip on this side. And I think I've just managed to push the other one back in. And finally, clips up the end. There's one there. The other one is actually hidden by this foot here, but usually if you just kind of jiggle it around a little bit, you should be able to pop it open without having to remove that foot. Next, you want to separate these clips along the front here. So I just usually start on this side, just lift up the clip or put a screwdriver under it and just sort of hold that open with your other hand. Move on to the next clip, next clip, next clip. Obviously, if the warranty seal is still there, that's probably a good thing, but you will have to break it. 
move around to the back of the console and this is where this tool is invaluable. There's little clips, a couple on this side and a bunch along this side that you need to pop open. And with this tool, you simply just line it up with these two clips on this side, push the tool in and pull it open with your fingers. Make sure that you just keep holding it open. Otherwise the case will try and snap back together. With that part just held open, you take the tool and bring it to the other side and line it up with the little holes. I can't actually see what I'm doing. Line it up with the holes on this side, push the tool in, that should pop open the clips. And with any luck, assuming you don't close this side back up, that's it. You'll have the two halves separated, then you can flip it over onto its top. Now, if you open up the console and see different screws in this area, that's probably a bad sign as it means somebody's probably done some kind of mod uh, to either replace the X clamps or modify them in some way. And that's probably a telltale sign that your Xbox has had the red ring of death and somebody's tried to revive it, but there's a good chance it'll probably red ring again. Once you've had an issue with the GPU, which is the main cause of the problems on these machines, uh, that fault will come back regardless of what you do. The only real way to fix it is to swap out the actual GPU itself with a different one. So there's a good chance that hasn't been done and somebody has just done the old towel trick or the reflow. But unless they've actually swapped out the GPU with a fully working one, you're probably going to have the Red Ring of Death come back sooner rather than later. Anyway, let's carry on disassembling this thing. So we're going to need our T10 bit. Oh, and before I forget, we need to remove this little eject button. It just pops off that little post there. And aside. So we're just going to go around and remove these four screws on the outside and these two screws in the middle. That'll allow us to take the top cover off. Now I did own a 360 back in the day. I actually had one of the launch models and no surprise it did Red Ring of Death. I actually tried to bring it back to life and um, yes it failed miserably. I went out and bought a little electric fry pan kind of thing uh, to act as something to warm up the uh, main board when I was doing the reflow and with a cheap like hot air gun not one of these things but like something you'd remove paint with I went ahead and attempted to reflow both the GPU and the CPU which did bring it back to life but no surprise it died again probably less than a week later I actually brought it back to life again after that and managed to do the JTAG glitch. So I got part of the way there, but then it red ringed. I think I managed to boot into Zell, which is the main thing that you need to get into in order to get like the CPU key to start hacking it. So I managed to get that. And then after I wrote it all down and turned off the machine and tried to power it back on again, it red ringed again. So that was kind of the end of my um, 360 hacking journey. So with those screws removed, the top cover will just lift off. Sometimes the actual RF shield will sort of grab onto these metal parts. So you just need to sort of jiggle it around until it comes off. And then you should have a pretty good view of the main board. Next, we'll just remove this optical drive so you can just lift it out. And I'll just disconnect these from the main board itself. And that gets our drive out of the way. As you can tell, it's very clean in here. That's because I only just cleaned it out and obviously did the thermal paste while I was at it. So chances are, if you haven't opened your 360 in a long time, it's going to be very dusty. But yeah, this one has been cleaned out. All right, with all that out of the way, let's pop these fans out. So they just clip into this rear metal plate here. If you kind of lift up on the plate and pull forward on the fans, they should release. And then you should be able to lift that out and obviously disconnect the connector. Next we just want to take this little front panel off so you can just lift up on one of these tabs and that piece will come out and there's a few T8 size screws that we need to take out. And with the three screws removed just grab this by either side and just jiggle it out. There we go. And now we can go about removing the rest of the screws. So all these little black ones are T8 and these ones around the outside are all T10s. I'll just start with the T8 screws that are holding the X clamps in place. It doesn't really matter which way you go about this, just remove all the screws. 
So another thing to note about the reset glitch hack is if you try and connect to Xbox Live without some kind of stealth server or protection, uh, your console will likely be banned from Xbox Live very quickly. So keep that in mind if you're going to mod your 360, uh, be prepared to give up Xbox Live. Um, like I said, there are stealth servers out there, which basically protect Xbox from being able to see that your console's hacked, but most of them are paid services and they're not foolproof. So it's possible that you could still get your console banned, even using one of those services. Personally, I don't plan on using this machine on Xbox Live, and I think that's entirely fair because if you've gone ahead and hacked your machine, you're pretty much guaranteed that you're violating something in the Xbox Live Terms of Service. So it's well within Microsoft's right to actually ban your console from the service. And to be honest, you're potentially giving yourself an advantage over the other players on there who don't have a hacked console because hacking a console means you can also install certain mods for games and that kind of thing. So if you do still want to play on Xbox Live, I personally just recommend not hacking your console. Just leave it as it is. Enjoy it. Of course, one day Microsoft will shut down the Xbox Live servers and then you may as well go ahead and hack it. But uh, for now, if you're still using it, just leave it be, in my opinion. Of course, the reason I want to do this is because I like hacking stuff and also because I just want to see what else can be done with the 360. I like to be able to use the hardware to its full potential or at least to more potential than Microsoft allows us to. So with all those screws removed, you should be able to lift up on the main board at the front here and just pull it towards you. And now we've got the board free. The next thing you're going to want to do is pop these X clamps off and replace that thermal paste. Like I said, I've already done it on this machine not long ago, so I'm not going to do it again here. But if you've got this tool, the X clamp removal tool, it's a very simple process. You simply slide it in under these little notches in the X clamp and then lift up like so. The only challenge is getting this one here because it's right next to the other X clamp. So you sort of have to maneuver it around a little bit until you actually manage to pop that in. But like I said, I'm not going to be removing the X clamps today because I've already done the thermal paste just recently. And to get them back on, you pretty much just lift up that way, push the X clamp down and it should pop over the little posts. So that's how you do the X-clamps with this tool, and it is so much easier than trying to get in there with a flathead screwdriver or something, because there's a whole bunch of traces under here, and it's very easy to slip and scratch a bunch of those traces, and then you're in a world of pain. So definitely get the X-clamp removal tool. They're cheap, and they're effective. Let's now get our components prepped, so we'll put the board aside for a minute. We'll first start with the diode and the resistor, and you'll also probably want some thin wire, wrapping wire, or kynar wire. This, I think, is 30 gauge, so you want something around 30 gauge or 28 gauge. You don't really want to go much bigger than that, so 26 or 24 might be a little bit too thick, because the points on the main board that we're soldering to are quite small, so I'd recommend probably 30 gauge or 28. Now there are a couple of ways to do this. You can either solder wires to both sides of the diode and both sides of the resistor and then connect the two wire ends to the board or you can connect one end of each component directly to the board and just solder a wire to the other point. I'm going to do the latter and just connect one end of each component to the board and just have a wire coming off the component that's going to solder to the other point that it needs to go to. It's totally up to you which way you want to do it. Uh, it's probably easier to solder wires to both ends because then you're only dealing with the very fine wire to solder to the board, but I like a challenge sometimes, so why not do it the hard way? So I'm just going to grab a couple of decent lengths of wire, probably something like that. It should be fine. About the width of the main board. Doesn't need to be this long, but it's good to have more than less. And the same with, let's say, blue. So because I'm going to solder one side of this to the board, I'm just going to wrap the wire around the opposite side. Just something like that. And the same with the diode. And for the diode, I'm going to solder the cathode end to the board. So I'm going to put the wire on this side, which is the anode. So the side without the stripe will have the wire on it. And we'll see why I'm doing that soon enough. Cool. So we'll just throw some solder over those just to hold it all together. All right. And that's this end prepped. 
before I solder those to the board, let's just prep the Raspberry Pi Pico. So this is what we're going to use to read and then flash the NAND chip. And we need to connect to the seven pins on the lower right corner of this board. So I'm going to put a pin header over those seven pins. And that's just going to allow me to plug this in and out whenever I need to. Cool. That's our Pico prepped. I'll go over the reason why I chose these particular colors in a minute, but this should just simply plug straight into there. Let's go ahead and solder in the resistor and the diode. These are going on the back side of the board. There is an alternative point for the resistor on the top side of the board, but I'm going to stick to the back side points. And these are basically what's going to glitch the console in order to read our custom NAND that we eventually flash with the Pico Flasher. So let's go ahead, solder these two in, and then we'll flip the board over, solder in the Pico Flasher, and get everything set up. So our diode here, the cathode end, which is the black stripe end, is going to go towards the bottom of this X clamp here to a point called FT6U7. And the other end of that wire ends up over here somewhere. So we need about that length. Obviously, I'm going to put some heat shrink over this just to stop any of this from shorting out to the board. And the resistor will go from this point over here, just under this hole. So that point there over to a point just around near this heat sink. So that to there and that over to there somewhere. All right, let's prep these points on the board. For this, I'm going to use the microscope. You don't necessarily need a microscope to do this, but I'm currently in the process of reviewing this thing, so we may as well include it. The first point I'm going to do is this one right here. This is where our resistor leg is going to go to, so it's just below this hole, sort of on the right-hand side of the board. I'm just going to put a little bit of no clean flux on there and just touch that up. Add a tiny bit of fresh solder. Tiny bit more flux and then we're just going to bring in the end of our resistor leg. It's my first time soldering under a microscope so bear with me. Right, that is solid. The other end of the resistor is going to go to this point down here. So it's just near TP7R1 and TP7R3. It's this little point just here. Let's go ahead and add some no clean flux in there. All right, that is connected. I have to say I'm really not used to soldering under a microscope, but I got there in the end. So the spot we're looking for is FT6U6, so this one right here. That's where the cathode end of this diode needs to go, so I might actually trim that leg down just a little bit. Let's again put some flux on there, tiny bit of fresh solder. Cool. All right, that connection is good. Let's do the other end. So back over near the AV output, we're looking for this point here near R3P6 and R3P7, and that solder connection right there. All right, that seems good. All right, so that should be all the fine soldering done. So our diode, the cathode end goes to this point down here and snakes up up to this point over here. And the resistor goes from this point here over to this point over here. So those will remain in place. Now we just need to solder in the points for the uh, NAND flasher, so the Pico. And that's gonna go on the top side on this header over here and this header up here. 
Now, the reason I went with this color wiring is because this matches the guide online. So the orange wire will connect to the very last pin on the Pico and it goes brown, yellow, red, black, blue, green. So these three wires, brown, orange, yellow, will come in from this side and go to this header down here, sort of like that, but obviously a little bit more grouped together. And the other two wires, the black and red, go to the other side of that header, sort of down in like that. And then the green and blue wires go up to this header here, with green being up the top near this tantalum, so there's a little positive symbol on the board, so the green sort of sits in that post, and the blue sits in the one below it. So let's just prep all these pads. I'll just add some fresh solder to them in a bit of flux. Right, and what we should end up with is something like this. It did take a bit of effort to get, especially some of these soldered in place, but they are currently solid. Um, these are not gonna stay on the board, so it doesn't really matter uh, if they're not pretty. They just need to be properly connected and not shorting out to each other or anything else for that matter. So now all of this can simply plug straight into our Pico like so. Let's get the Raspberry Pi Pico prepped and then get to flashing. Alrighty, over on the computer, we want to grab Balika's Pico Flasher. So simply head to the GitHub page. I'll put links down below. Grab the latest release, which at the time of filming is version three. Download the Pico Flasher UF2. And we also want to head to Optal 450's GitHub page and grab the latest release of JRunner with Extras, which is version 3.22 R3 as of filming. Let's get our Pi Pico prepped. So we just need a micro USB cable. Just plug one end into the computer. And while holding down the little boot select button, plug in the other end into the Pico itself. Once you've done that, a thing should pop up on your computer with the Raspberry Pi Pico. And all we need to do is drag the Pico Flasher UF2 onto that drive. It should load up there and then automatically close. We can now disconnect the Pico Flasher. And let's extract all the JRunner with extras software. Cool, that should be good to go. Let's open up JRunner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there we are. All right, so now all we need to do is connect the Pico up to the Xbox and obviously back up to the computer. Plug in the Xbox 360, but do not turn on the power. What I might also do is just reconnect the fans and just kind of point them over the heat sinks. The heat sinks aren't really firmly attached without the bottom RF shield because they screw into that metal plate. So just going to kind of sit the fans over these heat sinks just to try and keep everything cool while we have this thing running. All right, let's plug in our Pico flasher, making sure we get all the wire colors around the right way, which should be no problem in this instance. I hope. Let's plug this into USB. Like so. Plug in our power to the Xbox, but do not power it on. Cool. Now you'll notice that this has changed to Pico Flasher, so it's detected the Raspberry Pi Pico. We're just going to click this little question mark next to console type, and we get console not found. Oh, okay. So unplugging the Pico Flasher and plugging it back in seems to have worked. So, all right, it looks to identify the console as either a Xenon, a Zephyr, or a Falcon. This is a Falcon board, so that looks good. And it's got a 16 megabyte NAND. Let's try and read the NAND, see what we can do. So it's currently reading the NAND. I think it does two NAND reads and then verifies them against each other to make sure they're correct. Okay, so it looks like it found a couple of bad blocks, but they were both the same on both reads, so that's not a big issue. Next thing we want to do is select RGH3, which is what we're going to be using. I'm going to leave it on 27 megahertz. If that doesn't work, uh, we can always try 10 megahertz, but we'll try 27 for now. And then we want to create a Zell. You should get Zell image created. Then we just need to write the Zell to the 360.
Okay, it says the write was successful, so now we just need to power on the 360, see if it boots into Zell, and then we should be able to get the CPU keys. So I'm going to plug in HDMI, and I'm going to plug in a network cable because it's easy just to get Zell to talk straight to JRunner and give it the CPU key rather than me trying to write it down and potentially stuff it up. So plug that in as well, and we're going to disconnect the Pico for a minute. It can just flop about over there. Let's plug in our little front board and power on. Well, that didn't get us very far. So the fans spin for a second, the light turns green, but then pretty much turns off a second later and the fans stop. Well, that's no good. Okay, after a good amount of head scratching and looking again under the microscope, I finally figured out the issue. In fact, there were two issues. First of all, I soldered that diode to the wrong point. I put it on FT6U6, and it's supposed to be FT6U7. And I also broke the trace that was going to FT6U6, which uh, didn't help at all. But I finally fixed all those things up. The microscope really did come in handy for fixing up that little bit of trace repair. I'll show you what I did there uh, in a minute, but let's try and boot this up, see if it now boots into Zell. All right, so the console appears to be booting up. The little four lights around the outside are doing their thing. And we've got Zell. Excellent. I've got the network cable connected, so we should be able to just grab the network IP address, which is 192.168.137.180. So 192.168.137.180. And if we hit get CPU key, that looks about right to me. Right, let's power off the console. And we can disconnect these things and plug back in our programmer. Right. We're going to create the XE build image. The last thing to do is just hit right and end. Cool. Right, successful. So let's disconnect the programmer and we'll leave the wires attached just for a minute, just until I confirm that everything is working as expected. And then we'll come in and just disconnect all the programming wires. Let's have a look at the mess that I made on the back of the board first. So I pretty much got in there and redid all the wiring. So this now routes around here and the diode's actually in the middle of this and the resistor's in the middle of this one, which is what a lot of people suggest to do, but I was feeling cocky. But yes, everything is still connected at the right points and I've fixed up this wiring here, which is now connected to the right spot. Let's have a quick look under the microscope. You can see what I did wrong there. So looking under the microscope, I originally connected everything to 0.6 here, and I also burnt the little solder pad. So I had to get a tiny bodge wire, stick it in the middle of that hole, and then solder it back onto the remaining trace that was here. So thankfully that actually fixed that, and there was no way I could do this without a microscope. So I am happy to have this microscope on hand now. And yes, 0.7 is now where the uh, diode is supposed to go to, the cathode end. So that's all good there, and yeah, thankfully I was able to fix this um, damage here. Oops. So, I've got a USB stick. This is just like a 16 gig one. All I'm going to do is put it in here and just reformat it using the 360. So we're just going to go to storage, find the unformatted device. Uh, uh, sure. Yes. Okay. Right, so I've now formatted it with the Xbox 360. I'm going to power this back off again. Okay, with the USB drive back in the computer, we'll probably get something that looks like this. Now, we do need to see hidden files and folders. So this is Windows 11. So we just go down to hidden items. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit different for Windows 10 or Windows 7 or Windows 8, if you're weird. What we need to do is jump into the content folder, which should be currently empty. And we need to create a new folder in here with 16 zeros. Just like that. Next, I'm going to reference the console mods wiki here and a shout out to Durf and everyone who's involved in getting this wiki up and running. 
we are going to grab XEX menu, Aurora, and Dash launch. So let's just go through those. And we should be able to click on this and download. And we'll get Aurora. And finally, Dash launch. All right, and with those three things downloaded, we first want to grab XEX menu and extract this to the folder that we created on our USB drive. So the content and then triple zero, that's where we want to put our code 999 folder. And then we want to put Aurora in its own folder on the USB stick. So I'm just going to create a new folder on there. Let's call it something like utils. And we'll put another folder in that called Aurora. And it's pretty much the same for Dash Launch. So we'll go back into our USB drive, Utils, and I'll make a new folder called Dash Launch. If I could spell. Cool, and now our USB drive should look something like this with Aurora and Dash Launch in here and the XCX menu in the content folder. So heading back over to the console, we want to power it on. I've already gone ahead and installed the hard drive, but again, you want to make sure that you're not connected to any networks. So you don't want to give this thing internet access, at least not yet. We're going to put in our USB stick. I'm just going to sign into this random profile that I created. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do this right now, but it will force you to create a profile when you try and open up the next thing. So head over to settings and then down to system down to storage we're going to find our usb storage and go into demos and you should see xcx menu here and it should say game demo if everything looks right there then you're on the right track if not double check that you've copied everything correctly to the usb drive and if you're still not getting any luck you may have to go back and do the flashing process again so we're going to copy this over to the hard drive Excellent, and then we're going to back out of this, go to the hard drive, look in demos, and we should see XCX menu in there. That looks good. Back out of everything here, and then head back over to games, into my games. There's going to be two of these here because one of them is on the USB stick, one of them is on the hard drive. doesn't really matter which one you launch. Right, and we are in XEX menu. Now, if you didn't create a profile, it would have asked you to create one just there. So that's just what you need to do. So we want to hit the right bumper on the controller, which will take us over to our USB stick. Head down to utils or whatever you call that folder where you put the other dashboards. Press Y and hit copy. And then press X and go to hard drive one. Press Y again and hit paste. Head into Utils and into Aurora. Scroll down until you find Aurora.xex and launch that. And at the moment it's showing no titles found. So what we need to do is press the start button to go into settings. Head down to content and then over to manage paths and hit add. We're going to select our location, so we want to add hard drive one and then highlight utils and press Y to select that. You can leave the scan depth and you can probably just change that to applications and hit save. It should automatically scan that folder to try and find whatever else is in there. And you can now see that there's an option of Zell launch, Aurora or installer. It will automatically download the cover art images once you're connected to the network. But again, you don't want to do that at this point. We just want to find the one that says installer and press A. And that should bring you into Dash Launch. There's a couple of things we want to change in here. So go into pass by hitting the A button. And we want to go down to where it says default, press A. This is going to set our default dashboard on boot and also the default dashboard when you exit out of a game or an application or whatever. So I recommend setting that as Aurora because that way you go straight to Aurora, skipping the original dashboard, which is kind of useless at this point. So we're going to head into hard drive by pressing A, down to utils, Aurora, and then go to aurora.xex and press A. You can also hold down one of the controller buttons to go into a different dashboard, and that's what these options are down here. So I do recommend setting one of those up. 
just so by default it'll go into Aurora but when you power on the machine or exit out to the dash you can also hold a button on the controller which will take you to a different dash and I recommend at least setting one of those up for dash launch so I'm going to use button A for this so we'll go in there back into hard drive back down to utils and this time go into dash launch installer and find the default XEX and you can even set up another button for XEX menu if you want so I'll do that so head into content, find the 000, code 999, la la la, and XEX menu. So I'm happy with how that looks, but we're going to scroll down a bit more because we do want to check out some other things in here. First of all, in the behavior tab, I recommend turning content patch and XBLA patch on. Also license patch as well. This will help with certain backup content. I'm not going to go into any other details about that. There are plenty of guides online or other videos on YouTube where you can check that out. I'll throw a link to a playlist from Modded Warfare. He goes into a lot more detail about kind of setup options here and also Xbox Live and that kind of thing. So it is a few years old, but I think most of it's still relevant. So check that out if you want to go into further detail. A lot of these other options I'm just going to leave as is, but I will change one more and that is region spoofing. And then scrolling down even further, we want to head into network and you want to make sure that live block and live strong are both enabled. That'll block the Xbox from trying to connect back to the Xbox live servers, which will get you an instant ban. Those are the main things that I recommend doing right now. There is more options in there if you browse through and read the little description. There's also a good guide, again, on the console mods wiki, so I'll link that down below as well if you want more info about some of these options. The next thing we're going to do is hit the right bumper, and this should bring up a list of devices. So we just want to make sure this is saving everything to the hard drive, and you can press the X button to force save those settings. Again, if we hit the right bumper, there is one more thing that I want to do, and that is under system info. And I just want to make sure that these target temperatures are all set to around 60 degrees or thereabouts. Especially for an older 360, these have issues with overheating. So I'd rather the fan speeds ramp up at 60 degrees rather than leaving it at the default, which is around 70 or 80 degrees normally. So I don't mind an extra little bit of fan noise if it's going to prolong the life of the console, which hopefully it will. I pretty much ignore this fan speed override setting here. I'm not going to play around with that. And once you're happy with everything, hit save config. You can now press the B button to back out of that menu. And if you press the B button again, it should take you back to Aurora, which is now our default dashboard. At this point, you can also test out the other dashboards. So if I tell it to go to Xbox home by pushing the Y button and then exiting this and holding the A button, it should boot us into dash launch. And likewise, if I try and go to Xbox home, and hold the B button, it brings us into XEX menu. So that looks all good there. Again, hit the Y button, go to the regular dash without holding anything, and that should take us to Aurora. So at this point, as long as you've made sure that Live Block and Live Strong are enabled in Dash Launch, we're going to connect this thing to the internet. Now, because this is an older Xbox, it doesn't have Wi-Fi built in and I don't have one of the Wi-Fi adapters. So I'm just going to use a regular network cable and hook it into this laptop and enable network sharing. To do that on Windows 11, you can just head into the network connections, find your Wi-Fi network, hit properties, sharing, and then allow other computers. Just to make sure the Xbox grabs the right IP address and all that from the computer, I'm just going to power it off and power it back on. And it should now boot straight into Aurora. Don't stop booting now, you bastard. Took a few seconds longer that time, so yeah, the RGH3 can be hit and miss, like I've already said. Thankfully, it is still booting. And there we go, Aurora. Now we need to set up some further options in here so we can take full advantage of cover art and all that kind of thing. So, hope if I power on the controller. So hitting start to go back into settings, we want to go down to profile and enable our Unity connection. Now you will need a Unity account, which is pretty simple to set up. You can head back over to where you downloaded Aurora and just click on the link to Unity. 
and then just hit register. Fill in the details, you'll get a activation email, so you do need to activate it. And then you should have a username and a password that we can put into Aurora on the 360. So we'll throw in our Unity username and then go down to API key and hit request. That will ask you for the password that you used for Unity. And if nothing happens, that indicates there's an issue with the network connection, which is what's happening right now. So we're going to head back over into the guide, go over to settings and enter the system settings. Go down to network settings, wired network, and we're going to test PC connection. Right, so everything does look correct there, so I'm not sure why it's not asking me for my password at this point. Let's try that again. Ah, here we go. Enter our password, and we should get an API key. So now Aurora can connect to Unity, and that can give you cover art and a whole bunch of other extra options. I'm not going to go into every single detail about this dashboard, we're just doing sort of the basics for now. If we head back over to Assets and hit Download, that should force it to download all the cover art and all that kind of thing. So it may take a couple of minutes. I guess it depends on how much load there is on their server at the time, but you can see cover art is now popping up here. And there we are. So that looks at least a little bit better. We can tell what these things are, but we don't have any games yet. Now, I'm not going to go into how to get games. Um, I'm just going to show how to back up a game that you've already got on disk. So we'll use this as an example. This is Guitar Hero World Tour, which I don't even have the guitar for anymore, but we'll put that in the drive. And if you just want to play games off the disc, they will also show up in Aurora and it will also download cover art for them. So you don't have to copy them over to the hard drive. You can just play them off disc if you prefer. And there we go. Aurora has grabbed the cover art for that. We can also hit Y to go into details and you can look for title updates assuming they're available on the Unity Marketplace, which looks like there is one here, so we may as well install that while we're at it. Now, in order to apply the title update, you do need to actually launch the game from Unity, uh, from Aurora. Keep getting those two mixed up. There are a few different ways to bring everything from the disk over to your hard drive, so we'll go through the most basic option first. If we hit the back button on the controller and go into File Manager, we want to scroll down to our hard drive and create a new folder. So if you go over to the left, you can see these options here. We're going to create a new folder. I'm just going to call it Games. I've got a keyboard right in front of me. Why am I not using that? Cool, and then when we back out of that, we can head to the DVD drive and we want to press X to select everything that shows up here. Scroll down on the left hand side to where it says copy, press A, go back over to the browser, whoops, went back too far, if you go back too far you have to go back in and select everything again, so try not to hit B too much. Alright, we want to go to hard drive 1, into games, and probably create a new folder in here as well. Uh, we'll just call it GHWT, that'll do. Open up that folder, and on the left hand side we want to scroll down to where we find paste, and hit A. This will copy everything, all the individual files that is, from the disk to our internal hard drive. Now depending on the game, this can take anywhere from 5 minutes to probably about an hour. I found with this particular disk, it's got a lot of tiny little files on it, and they seem to take forever to copy over this way, so I'm not going to sit here and wait for that because, uh, yeah, it's going to take forever. So I'm going to abort that and I'll show you the other way, which is a lot faster for this particular game, but it doesn't copy over the individual files. It copies everything over as a god or game on demand, which will limit the options if you want to install mods for that particular game because you don't have all the individual files there. Personally, I don't plan on installing any mods for Guitar Hero World Tour, so I'm happy just to copy it over the faster way. Let's see how that's done. I'm just going to quickly delete this little bit that it did copy over. So we've still got our folder there with games GHWT. And we're going to go down to scripts. You should see Aurora Repro Browser. We're going to go in there. And utility scripts. And I'm going to grab the Aurora Disk 2 God installer. 
back out of there, back out. And now we have the distal guide installer. So it wants us to select a directory where we want to save the actual game. So I'm going to go back into hard drive one, games, and then hit Y to select GHWT. You can hit yes to this part. And this is going to copy everything over from the disk to the hard drive. So we'll still be able to play the entire game off the hard drive without having the disk inserted. But it does limit options if you've got certain game mods that require access to the individual files for that game. All right, cool. That took just over 10 minutes. Like I said, when I tried to copy it the other way, it took about half an hour to get up to 40%. I actually cancelled it at that point. So I assumed it'd take an hour plus to actually copy it the other way. So that's a pretty decent time save, I guess. But of course, you can install games from, say, a USB stick if you know where to find the games. I'm not going to go into that kind of thing. But let's just have a look at what we need to do now because there are a couple more steps in order to get Aurora to look at the hard drive to find our games. So we're going to select a no to this option because we want to set up our game folder. So we want to head back into our settings menu by hitting the start button, go down to content and add another path. And we're going to select our games folder. So hover over games and hit Y to select that. And we want to change the scan depth to three. So it's three folders deep that it's going to go looking for the executable file. So I know that we've got Guitar Hero World Tour and then there's like two other folders before it's actually going to find the XEX. So change that to three. You don't have to worry about changing anything for the script data. Just hit save. And we can do a scan now. And you can see that we're going to have two copies of World Tour. So if I eject this from the drive, it may not immediately update, but I'm guessing if I try and launch one of these, one of them is going to work, one of them won't. There we go. Ugh, I don't want to go back to this. All right, so this is the one that's actually going to work. Again, we're just going to check to see if title updates are available. So yes, we do need to install that again. Oh, no, it's already been installed. Cool. So we can now launch Guitar Hero straight from the hard drive without the disk. One more thing we'll look at is bringing over Xbox Live Arcade games. So you're going to want to have the game on your USB stick. Again, don't ask. Hit the back button so we can get back into the file manager and I'm going to create another folder on the hard drive. And we'll call this one XBLA. Head into our USB stick. Find the game that you want. Head over to copy. Oops, I did not select that first. All right. And then head back to our hard drive, back into our new folder, and we're going to go to the left and go to paste. Cool. Once that's copied over, you can remove the USB stick if you don't have anything else to copy over. And I'm just going to quickly go into this folder just to see how many folders deep the actual executable is. So it looks like three folders again. So we'll back out of this, head back into the settings, and we're going to create one more path to XBLA, select that, and scan depth of three. Again, we don't have to worry about any script data. Hit save, and it's already scanning it by the looks of it. And there we are. Just quickly check for any updates. No content found. Oops, that's content. Yes, there is DLC content that may come across through Unity. Um, by pushing left or right, it changes from title updates to DLC to file manager. But looks like there's nothing for this game. So we should now be able to launch that. And it should fire straight up, but some games might not play so nice. So again, you want to check that you've got the settings correct in Dash Launch. So looking in behavior, you should have these enabled. If that still doesn't work, there are other options, um, but you'll need to do a little bit of Googling to find out how to do it. 
Now I'll probably go ahead and put some emulators on this as well. There is so much more that you can do with a modded Xbox 360, but I think that's probably going to do it for this video. So I'm going to leave it here and I want to give a big thanks to the people at Console Mods. Uh, thanks to Modded Warfare for his tutorial videos. Uh, shout out to Mr. Mario and also Modsville USA. If you want to know more about Xbox 360 hacking, I recommend checking out their channels. But for me, I'm going to leave this here. But if there's enough interest, I'll come back and we'll do some other mods to this. Anyway, let me know in the comments what you thought. And as always, a huge thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. If you want to do the same, links to that are down below. You'll get ad-free early access along with a bunch of other neat little goodies. And until next time, I will see you next time. Bye. Yes, I am only capturing this at 25 frames per second.